Woof woof and namaste. This is Hill Dog and welcome to Kana Cast, a series of conversations with visitors and residents of Kana Shantivanam, the International Centre for Heartfulness near Hyderabad in Telangana, India. Today I'm speaking to Sister Christine Jones. A short time ago I had also spoken to Christine's husband Brian Jones, so I'm literally keeping up with the Joneses. Christine is a craniosacral therapist and a long-time heartfulness practitioner and trainer. For those of you who don't know, heartfulness is a meditation technique that is offered for free by volunteer trainers around the world. It was earlier known by the name Sahaj Marg or the natural path. One of the specialities of heartfulness is meditation with the transmission of a very subtle energy. Central to heartfulness is also the concept of a yatra or spiritual journey, which goes through specific points or chakras in the body. Think of it as an evolution of consciousness where you are looking through different windows and each window offers a different view. Since there will be a lot of reference to heartfulness in this talk, let me just fill you in on the heartfulness guides. The first guide was Lalaji, then there was Babuji from 1983 to 2014. Chariji was the heartfulness guide. And uh, from 2014 to the present day, Daji has been the heartfulness guide. You will also hear the word master during this talk. Master refers to both the heartfulness guide as well as the inner master or the higher self that is within us and all around us. Practitioners of heartfulness meditation or Sahaj Marg are called abhyasis. And a heartfulness meditation session is called a sitting. About your about your childhood days and things like that, was there ever an inclination towards meditation at that time? Now you are deeply involved, you're also a trainer in heartfulness meditation. But can you trace this back to something in childhood? Was there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I wouldn't have ever considered myself a seeker through my teens and, you know, my young adult life. But I remember when I was very, very little, um, I would lay in bed at night and I would play this game with myself that I would try not to think. And I would make myself so still and, you know, try to make my mind so calm. And then when as soon as a thought would come in, I would pretend I lost the game and I'd start again, you know, and I played this game for so long. And then it faded away and I didn't even remember it. And then when I started heartfulness, um, I remembered when my preceptor gave me sittings, I said, oh my God, I, I used to do this when I was little. I said, it must have been a sign of the future. And he said, no, you probably brought it with you. <laughs> <laughs> so... There was that, and then I also remember feeling something incredible was going to happen in my life. I, I remember thinking that very little. I thought, something incredible is going to happen, and I didn't know what it was. And then I had forgotten that, too, <laughs> until years later. Um, <clears throat> it was actually two weeks before I started Heartfulness. I kept feeling like I was having some sort of spiritual awakening. And it was really two weeks before I met Brian, my husband, Brian Jones. And um, I went home one night and I said, this is it. Just take me. I just want to go. I don't want to be here anymore and try to figure it out, you know. And I laid on my bed and um, I could feel myself rising up out of the body. And I looked down and there was no fear at all. And I was just like, okay, this is it. This is what you've been waiting for. You're going to meet God. <laughs> you know? And uh, and then I went back down and I was so angry. I'm like, oh, why? You know, I was all ready. I wasn't afraid. Why are you sending me back here? You know? And then two weeks later, I met Brian and the journey began. And then um, Brian was already meditating. He was already meditating for five years. Yeah. And then um, I was getting sittings from John Barlow. And when he gave me a sitting, Babaji was present. And he said, remember the night you wanted to die? He said that was our first meeting. Wow. You felt that in a oh, sitting? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if he felt like his presence was there, you know, and he said, Remember the night you wanted to die? That was our first meeting. So, so John felt this, or you, you? I did. 
You felt it. I wow. Did. Yeah. John was giving me a sitting. Wow. And wow. that's when I realized. I thought, oh, that was a. And that was such a private experience. It was a private experience that somehow confirmed, you know, um, that I wasn't worried about losing myself <laughs> on this journey with Brian. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is a. So uh, this uh, little game that you played. Uh, <laughs> Was was it coming from something uh, where you grew up? Was it a very religious family, or uh, was there uh, some spiritual bent that the family had? The only spiritual bent was my mom. Mm -hmm. You know, she used to tell me the story that you know every day when she was little, she would stop at the church and open the door, and she'd say, "Hello, God, this is Angie." <laughs> And she did it, you know, for years. And she said one day she opened the door and she heard, before she could get it out, she heard, hello, Angie, this is God. Oh, my God. And so that <laughs> was like, you know, like I was, that was the thing, I think, that made me want to just like be so still. And I don't think I was thinking I was going to meet God when I was little. It just was a natural inclination to calm the mind. Mm -hmm. So it was there very early on. Mm -hmm. And even when I became a mother, it was there then, too. Like, I would put my daughter down for a nap, and then I would take a nap, and I would do the same thing, you know. And that was before I met Brian also. You know, I would just try to make my mind really still, you know. So I, I, I think John was probably right. I probably did bring it with me because in my days in Catholic school as a, you know, <laughs> As a teenager and a youngin, the nuns were sure I was going to hell. <laughs> so I don't think there was any spiritual, you know. Are you, I, so you were a troublemaker in Catholic school? I kind of was, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know, when I look back, I think I, think I was blocking it out, that I didn't want to be influenced by mm -hmm. religion, and I wasn't, you know, and that wasn't always a good choice. <laughs> so what was it like? I mean, if you take us back to that time, your friends, and what was the kind of life then? Was it easy to talk to them about spirituality, or was this something that was a personal thing that you went on? It was very personal, mm -hmm. yeah. My mom, I could talk to my mom about it, mm -hmm. you know, but um, pretty much no one else, and that was one of the reasons why I knew the minute I met Brian. I said to my mom that night when I went home, I said, I met the man I'm gonna marry. Wow. <laughs> because, um, it was like a breath of fresh air. You know, he was always talking about spiritual things, you know, and I was just like a little kid, like, oh, I'm going with him. <laughs> so. And the popular atmosphere at that time, this is, I'm guessing, uh, when the flower power movement had kind of taken off and. Uh... Yeah, but I grew up in a very cookie cutter suburbia, you know, and so we just cared about being rebellious. You know, we'd go to church and we'd stand in the back. And then as soon as the priest would start the sermon, me and my girlfriends would sneak out to the donut shop. And then we'd sneak back when he was almost finished, like we were there the whole time. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So there, I don't remember anything, you know, that led me to think I would be where I'm at today, except those very early, early experiences alone. So tell us about uh, your first sitting, sister. How was your first sitting when you decided to start meditation? You you met Brian before that, right? We did, but I, I did meet him before that, uh, before getting the sittings. But I actually um, meditated for several years before ever having three individual sittings. Mm -hmm. I meditated with Brian. And it was about three months after I was meditating every day. Um. And this was the first kind of meditation you tried, or yeah, was there anything before? No, it was the first one. And um, I remember I had my first genuine spiritual experience, and I came out of the room, and I said to Brian, I said, I think I met God. <laughs> That's wow. Because I didn't know what it was, because I grew up very Catholic, very Italian. You know, Jesus was on every wall. <laughs> So I didn't know how else to relate to what it was, you know. But then I said to Brian, I said, I think we should plan to go see Babaji because 
I kept thinking, how am I having this experience with this man over in India and I live here in America? How can this be? You know? Never having met him. No. No, and, and Brian kept saying, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is the real deal, <laughs> you know. So we we worked, you know, our way to save our money. We didn't have much money. We were young, you know, and uh, we made it to Germany to meet Babaji. And the closer we got to the house, Brian and I kept looking at each other. It's like the ground doesn't feel the same. <laughs> and when I walked in, I my first thought, upon seeing him was, I have to have what you have. And then my second thought was, why didn't anybody teach me in Catholic school to look for a saint of today? Because that was my only, mm -hmm. and I still wasn't really familiar with the term guru and disciple or, you know, it was saints and angels. And, and that was the beginning. I, I mean, when I look back, I think it took a long time for that to match in my heart, I think, but um, soul to soul, I knew we recognized each other mm -hmm. immediately. Wow. And the first actual formal sitting happened with John. John. The first formal sitting uh, happened with, yeah, I think it, it might have been Fred Weinstock, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think he came to Cleveland to visit us, and John and Betsy still hadn't lived there yet. Mm -hmm. So it was about a year after maybe one or two years after starting meditation, Fred came to Cleveland. And I think Fred gave me my first sitting. Then John and Betsy moved to Cleveland and they were our preceptors for several years. Wow. So did you notice any difference between uh, the time you were meditating on your own without uh, having the sittings and the time after the three sittings? Was there any change or was the sittings themselves anything you know, it always felt very profound for me from the beginning, with or without the sittings. I mean, even in my own meditations, it's always felt so natural for me to just go in my heart and settle myself and turn off the world, <laughs> you know? So um, I don't think the sittings were the link to the path for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it was my own inner experience that was indicating this, yeah. this so is real. Link had already been forged. It had already been there, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Wow. So, Brian, uh, I was speaking to Brian the other day, and he was telling us about, uh, you know, that you would go out to parties, you would have a lot of fun, drink a lot of beer. Those were the times, and... Uh, so this, this kind of life, did it gradually fall away, or did you suddenly suddenly have a realization that, uh, you know, the past has been left behind? It was gradual, you know, um, just like anything else, meat eating, you know, it all just started to fade away. And, you know, it was like in one moment, I thought, I can't do this anymore. And I can't go to parties with my friends. And I remember my one friend saying to me, oh, come on, what's wrong with you? And I remember that was the moment I thought, I can't be pulled by the friendship wanting to, you know, be part of my peer group, you know, and, and all of that faded away. Those friends faded away. And really, um, our whole life has been around relationships of people in heartfulness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And what about family? You you mentioned you came from a very uh, Italian Catholic background. Yeah. And so that's that's um, that's not easy for them to accept suddenly that you are now visiting this man in India who is your teacher and guide. Uh, how did the family take it? You know, when my mom was 60, I um, decided to take her to France to meet Chari for her 60th birthday. And so she, when Charji met her, he said, we've met before. And she goes, no, this is my first time here. And he goes, no, we've met before. And he goes, no. And my mom said, no, this is my first time here. And I was thinking, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. And then when she came out of the meditation tent the first day, she looked at me and she said, I've never felt so holy. 
So she accepted it, you know, mm. and would go to gatherings with us. And but my father was a different story. <laughs> yeah, he didn't accept it at all. But then Brian started doing so much work around the city, and we had an event at the Cleveland Museum, and I asked my father to come. And then after that event, my father said to me, um, he said, I don't know why I'm so upset with you. He said, because all you do is close your eyes and you don't hurt anybody. <laughs> so that was the first little inkling, you know, but then he'd go right back to, you know, he, he just, you know, his only point of reference was like cults and things like that, you know. But then when he was dying, the week he was passing, he said to me, um, I made peace with your life, mm. you know. So that was good. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you so you met Babuji in Germany. Mm -hmm. That was the first time yes. that you met him. And was there any other times that you met? Yeah, we met him in 1982 in Paris. Mm -hmm. And he was very different. Then. Must have been frail because... He was so frail and nobody was seeing him. Mm -hmm. And um, we were going to meet some friends at a, a cafe and I was coming down the steps and one of the French brothers said, Babaji's awake, do you want to come in? And so I went in the room, and um, it was just me and another sister, and she was sobbing, you know. And um, I sat down, and Babaji was smoking his hookah and never looked at me. He just was smoking the hookah and looking up at, I don't know, <laughs> whatever he was seeing. And... Um, all of a sudden, he said, I will be leaving soon. And I started to cry. And the girl had one Kleenex, and she ripped it in half, and she handed it to me. And I said, um, what am I going to do without you? And I finally found you. What am I going to do without you? You can't leave yet. And then he said, I will be with you for all eternity. And that was... That was really the grounding then of the transition from 1980, I think that was 1982, to Chargy becoming the representative in 1985. I just trusted it would be okay. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, because at that time of transition, a lot of people were confused. They didn't know what was happening. Chargy was, of course, nominated as the successor, but a lot of people had difficulty because... They had invested so much in Babuji, and Babuji had been the center of their lives in a certain yeah. way. Yeah. And so how was that for you? I guess you must have been meeting Jariji in those meetings with Babuji as well. And yeah. And suddenly from this guy who you, who's just casually hanging out with, and he's now the guide. What was that like for you? Um, you know, it, it, it was... You know, Chari was a disciplinarian in those early days. So I was a little, you know, a little apprehensive of <laughs> him becoming the successor. But I've, I've heard that from people in my own center. They said he was so strict. It was yeah. like, a, like a little dictator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was. But um, the transition for me was we went to France in 19... Well, he came to Cleveland in 1985. Chariji did. And we spent a week with him at Sister Veronica Hopper's house. And that was when we got to know him. But he wasn't the master to me. He was Babaji's representative. So I don't know if I really knew what that term meant, but I knew he wasn't the master, you know. And then <clears throat> in 19, I think it was 19, maybe 88 or 89. Or, no, it was 1987. We were watching a video of Babaji with Charji at some gathering. I don't remember where it was. And the look on his face was exactly like the look on Babaji's face when I met him. And that's when I knew. It, it was like instant. It was like, oh my gosh, you are my, you're my next master. You're my next teacher, my next guide, you know. So it happened in one moment just from seeing the look on his face watching Babaji, there was, it was so profound that 
it was the way I felt when I met Babaji. I could feel it coming from him. And that was when the transition happened, it was in one moment. Wow. The path seems to work that way for me. Like I'm a one-liner learner. <laughs> and you <t> tell <laughs> me one line and I'm different. You know, it doesn't take long for me. I don't have to read a book from cover to cover. Just open the book and read one line and transformation has happened. <laughs> wow. Wow. So then, of course, you are, you are devoted to this path and you are doing your meditation. And, I, and as we all know, the experiences over time change. The engagement changes with the practice. I mean, there's, there's priorities that you give to things. And then you were made a trainer. Tell us about that. When, uh, how did life change after that? You know, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. I don't know if I should say this on live, you know, radio here. But um, I think that when I saw what was happening from the inside out, it was so profound for me, you know, and... You know, sometimes people will say, you know, they'll want to hang a crystal over your chakra to realign it, you know. <laughs> and I remember thinking, this is not the same, you know. I, I, it just seeing it from the inside, what, what could take place was, um, it was like, I, I, I was astounded, you know. I was astounded. So... Becoming a trainer was um, was kind of funny because I didn't think I was really worthy of being a trainer. I was kind of surprised Charji asked me, you know, because I remember thinking, oh, John and Betsy, they're so busy with all these aviasis. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that, you know. <laughs> but of course, you know, you you once you see what's possible, you, of course, you dedicate your life to it because, so that was a, a, a an important, I've, I've always thought Charji made me a trainer for my own growth. It was never really about me being anything that was needed per se, but um, for my own evolution, for sure. And And when was this, sister? When were... I was made a trainer in 1985 when he came to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Veronica and I were made. Uh, oh, trainers so that at was the that was time. a pretty intense trip for yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, it was. Wow. Yeah, uh, the entire process of becoming a trainer, actually, you know, you have the preparatory sittings and things like that. That can be really deeply moving and profound as well. How was it for you? You know, I think I was a little immature. You know, I don't think I really knew what was really, really going to take place, you know? So, you know, it was, um, in a way, I think the path was like that for me for a long time. Like I was just being brought along without really grasping what was really happening on the internal journey. And really in the last few years, I've come to, really understand that if you are dedicated and you never give up, the path is just automatic. You know, but when my younger days, it was all about, was I worthy? Am I earning this? Do I, you know? So all that's kind of went to the wayside in the last, I'd say, decade. Mm -hmm. You know, just like, this has nothing to do with worthiness. This is just keep at it. Don't give up. And when you make that leap, you know it. And then the next leap's bigger. You know, Charji told us each leap is consecutively bigger than the last one. I can see that's really the wake-up call. It's like you're just not the same. Mm. And you didn't earn anything to get it. <laughs> you know, it just happens because of the caliber of the method and the lineage sure. of the masters. Sure. Sure, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, sometimes we are tempted to think that, okay, now I got it, and this is, this is it, and no further. 
have there have there been moments like that for you where you think now now I've got this figured out and I'm at a comfortable place every turn <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you think you got it he will definitely show you there's more and you still have a way lot more to learn <laughs> or unlearn maybe yes so as a trainer it also gives us the opportunity as trainers to talk about uh, the the practice and the meditation and the cleaning and i think that that helps our own learning so much just because we are talking to others about it um how do you explain it explain the practice especially in the modern context because it's a very different time from when you started meditation so to people coming to you today how would you explain what is the what is the crux of the process that's a good question um i would you know what i try to tell people i don't say a lot up front you know because i've always um built the uh young and so to speak on relationship you know like they just begin to trust you you know and you give a little more but in the very beginning you know i will usually tell people that um that it's the 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 soul that brought them there and that that's what they're trying to get in touch with is the deepest part of themselves and that you know when um they get a sitting you know it's really just i tell them that i go into a prayerful state and i make the prayer that whatever standing between you and your true self that's the part that will come forward for them and that's really what i usually tell people you know because i i i don't always think people understand sittings or you know and and it seems to have been enough because the experience speaks for itself sure you know sure so you know it's uh and it, you, you meet all kinds of people you know some people have profound experiences and don't even know you know and so the, it always shows me that it's not my place to get them there my place is to trust they found their way there and they'll find their way you know just keep it minimal mm -hmm. <laughs> and let them find their way yeah yeah and and transmission i mean how is your own understand that's the unique thing about the heartfulness uh, practice and sahaj mark is the transmission yes what has your own experience been of it uh was it immediately palpable or is it something that's changed over the years for me it was immediate mm -hmm. you know i i felt like and, and to me i mean looking back that was a good guiding post that cuz i've somewhere along the line realized that although the transmissions coming from the guide and it's been rediscovered by you know lology that ultimately they're here to taint to to teach us that it's in in ourselves you know and so when we're mirrored with that somehow we remember that it's there in us and when i look back i think that was my experience without having a preceptor for 1 to 2 years that i was drawing it on my own without even knowing that's what it was you know and um I mean I was youthful I didn't know what it was I just thought I was having a profound experience you know but looking back I think oh that's what that was so that's how I try to explain it to people you know that it it's actually in you but you need a model to help you remember that it's in you and mm -hmm. that's what the role of the guide is is there the model of why we were created I think you know why we were even put on the planet that's a that's a beautiful way to explain the role of the guide actually because it's um, that is something especially in the west is a challenge for people you know mm -hmm. to accept a a guide because you know there as you said there are these uh, points of reference that are cults and things like that and they think that you're just surrendering to another person and uh, doing his bidding mm -hmm. no matter what but it's a very different thing as you just said yeah 
And uh, after that time in 85 in Cleveland, you spend a week with Charity. And it's really nice. And how did your relationship with Charity evolve then? You know, from then on, it was um, really somewhat miraculous. You know, it was nice to be at peace and know you had a guide and um, he was going to show you the way, you know, and, and I think he did. I mean, we traveled with him all over the world, you know, and there were so many moments of, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, that you couldn't deny it. You couldn't deny it. And so you just kept, you know, going back for more, <laughs> basically. And uh, so you built up this relationship with Charity after that uh um, you know, brief time with Babuji and when he said that he will be with you for all eternity. And then in 2014, Chariji also left his body. How was that for you? Because this was a long time that you had spent together. Yeah, it was probably 30 some years. Mm. Um, you know, I wanted to cry but I, I couldn't cry from the heart, you know? I mean, I cried, but I could tell, like... And I think because he made, you know, the... Had had, had Daji working several years before he actually had his, you know, passing. Um, and we grew up with Daji, you know? So it, watching him change was an important part of the process of, you know, letting go of Charji and, you know, my brother becoming the master, <laughs> you know. But it was good. It was good. And I, and I asked Daji once before Chari passed, I said, do you ever worry about the goal? And he said, never. And I looked at him and I said, how do you do that? You know, and he said that once Babaji told him, once you come to the path, you're already at the goal. And I remember when he said that, I thought, that's where I'm making my mistake. I, I keep treading the path as if I still have to arrive somewhere. And I remember thinking, that's why you're the master. Because you listen to Babaji. I think he told me that was, Babaji told him that in 1972. Wow. So from 1972, all that time, he was already at the goal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that was the shift, you know, it was like, that was the beginning of our relationship as him being my teacher. Wow. Yeah. So the transition wasn't really, it didn't uh, ha bother you at all from no. Chariji to Daji? No, not at all. Not at all. Because I think when you can move from Babaji to Chariji, sure. everything else would be easier. <laughs> sure. But I think it's interesting because, um, you know, normally people think of succession as somebody nominates somebody else and uh, that person takes over. I mean, like you have in uh, in a regular company, you would have the, uh, you know, naming of a successor. But as you mentioned earlier about seeing Babuji in Chariji, mm -hmm. there is something of this essential transfer. It's difficult for us to tell it to anybody, you know, make anybody understand what succession really means. I mean, we, we call it a succession because we have no better words for it. But do you think there is an essence that of Babuji that goes to Chariji and from Chariji that goes to Daji? Absolutely. Because I think this is something that's being, um, oh, what's the word, uh, reestablished in true spirituality you know, is that, you know, in the old days, we had a teacher, but then it couldn't, you know, be transferred to the disciples. And all the disciples could do is teach from memory, and then it turns into a religion. I think our system is trying to um, r revive a, a living system again. And that's why, you know, when you think about moving from Chargi to Daji and Daji, revamping everything that that's the I think the awakening of really understanding 
it's a good thing to keep changing and reviving mm -hmm. and recalibrating and, you know, rebranding, as you would say, in the corporate world, sure, you sure. know. So I think he's a master at that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Although some people would be, uh, you know, would be apprehensive about change. Uh, what would you tell them? Some people would like to, like, uh, Sehaj Mark to stay the way it was, but they are, they can be somehow overwhelmed by the change. Have you come across that too? Oh yeah, many people, many people. But you know, since just since I've been here, I had this realization that if I don't go with the change, any change, whether it's in myself or my brothers and sisters or the world, you know, that I'm only extracting information and knowledge from my own creation. But when I step back and I let it all go, then the opportunity arises for us to, oops. That's okay. Not that's okay. Worry. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> the, I mean, my husband told you I'm gonna talk with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the opportunity arises that um, it's something beyond ourselves and let it show us what it could be because if you look at the world you know when you put it just in our hands you know you 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 can question things but that really opened in me since i've been here like oh i i don't want to extract from my own creation anymore i want to see what's behind you know my creation and what's in store for the next creation you know well wow. That makes me happy to think like that. Doesn't make me sad. And also, it keeps you open for further exactly. change. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, rather than resist, you know, in, because at any point you could, if you stop and say, "Okay, this is, I this is the final version," then you're just closing yourself up to anything that may happen in the future. Correct. So, sister, how has it been over the past few years uh, in America for you? Because it's been a tumultuous time. We had the COVID pandemic and uh, w people were isolated. Suddenly, you couldn't have the weekly gatherings. You couldn't have face-to-face -face sittings. Uh, how, how was this period for you? To be honest with you, Rudy, <laughs> it was the best time of my life. <laughs> I loved I knew when it happened, it was nature's way of saying, we got to slow this world way down. Mm -hmm. And I loved really being, you know, I mean, basically it was Brian and I, you know, and we couldn't see our kids or our grandkids or family. Um, and I really worked on myself in a different way without having the responsibility of leaving the house. You know, the first year we were in the house, <laughs> you know, we were having our groceries delivered. I mean, we didn't know what it was, you know, and my son-in-law's a scientist and a virologist. Yeah, and nobody had any clue. It was He was, was making us spray all the groceries before we brought them in the house, <laughs> you know, so. But, um, no, it was, a, I, I knew it was, um, I felt it was a gift I, I truly felt it was a gift. I didn't miss anybody. And we had Zoom and we had, yes, you know, for sure. we could talk on the phone to our kids. So when we weren't doing that, you know, we were, I was diving deeper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people uh, around the world actually had a lot of issues because they had never spent so much time together, even... Yeah. Married couples had issues because yeah. suddenly you were there twenty four seven together. Yeah. No, no opportunity to get out. But Brian and you that way have been such an, you know, I'll use the word inspiration if it doesn't embarrass you, for uh, couples because uh, this beautiful relationship that you have, and that has lasted since when? When did you guys tie the knot? Uh, 1978. Wow. The year I was born. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so what do you think keeps you together? What is the most? 
I think because we love the same thing, you know, I mean, we both knew Babaji was not your average human being. And, um, and we've had to fight to stay together. I mean, you know, we're very different. He's very, you know, down to earth, laid back, and I'm the exact opposite, you know, but when times got hard, you know, I think it was the path that made us push through the difficulties. And I remember Chargy telling us once, he said, the last quarter will be the best quarter in marriage. <laughs> and he was right, you know, <laughs> because now it's like we laugh so hard <laughs> when we're mad at each other, you know, <laughs> we, we end up laughing, you know, because it's mm. just not, it's just not important anymore to get him to do what I want him to do. <laughs> Yeah, I think because a lot of people think that, um, you know, think that, that that is the most important thing and they identify with that. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people listening may be going through that. But I think if you can just look beyond that, that is what I guess you have done. Well, I think when you go inside, you see that the ultimate relationship is with this deeper part of yourself. And then you start to just get wise, like, this man can't make me happy anyways. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he makes me happy, but I'm not trying to make him make me happy anymore. You know, my happiness is coming from myself. And that was a big transition for us when the path actually became our own individual journey. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when I think things really started to... Um, just be joyful, you know, that it, you, you, there really isn't anybody outside, even your own spouse, your own kids that are going <laughs> to do what can happen inside by you alone. That's why I think the aloneness during the pandemic was so important to me. And Brian did his own thing, you know, but I was studying the points and the circles and the yatra, <laughs> you know, going through them in myself and... I was as happy as could be. <laughs> you know, this is a question that a lot of people have is about the Yatra, since you've been to the Yatra Garden and mm -hmm. you have been studying during. Uh, because a lot of us um, don't pay that much attention to the points and the circles and things like that. They, it's, just, it's just we're on the path. We pay attention to the experience. But... Is, for you personally, is that experience enriched by the knowledge of the points and, you know, knowing what you're going through, not just experiencing it and being okay with whatever you're experiencing? Do you think it's vital to know? Hmm, that's a good question. I think it's been vital to know for me because when that experience started to happen, I started to think that I didn't know the path at all. You know, because I was, you know, studying point one, meditating on it for a week, studying point two, meditating on it for a week. And then after I went through it the third time, some huge shift happened inside. And that was sort of a like my understanding, like maybe you do need to know this. You know, <laughs> it just was sort of a, you know, not because you need the knowledge but just because you need to understand when a part of the journey opens in you, how well you work with it is really what the, the end result has to be. You know, because I remember one day after going through the heart region for the third time, I heard inside, now illusion will become Maya. And I thought they were the same. But just that little instruction shifted. I'm like, oh my God, illusion and Maya are different. And then of course, Daji says he always, whenever I have these sort of wake up calls, he leads me to some confirmation that I'm in the right direction. And he said that uh, illusion was created by us, but Maya was created by God. So when I heard now illusion will become Maya, I realized like I was going to end up working with it differently. And that came from inside of, of, you know, meditating on the points 
where they start to guide you out of your illusion so that you can handle the maya more efficiently when it shows up. Wow. Wow, that's beautiful, actually. And it's such an enriching path. There's so much nuance to everything. Yeah. It's just, the, I mean, you we could go on and on about yeah. how nuanced yeah. it is, really. Uh, lastly, I'd like to ask you, sister, I mean, uh, thinking back on the young Christine, <laughs> who is uh, the troublemaker in Catholic school, I mean, I, I'm sure if you look around uh, Cleveland, you'd find many girls in the same position. What advice would you give them if you had to tell them one thing? Oh, if I had to tell them one thing, I would say befriend yourself. That is beautiful. Yeah. That is beautiful advice and a beautiful note to end on, sister. Okay. But thank you so much for taking time out. It was mm-hmm. really beautiful. So that was my conversation with Sister Christine Jones. To listen to more such conversations, please subscribe to this channel. You can also find these conversations on Spotify on the Kanhakas channel. That is K-A-N-H-A-C-A-S-T. Thank you once again for tuning in. This is Hilldog signing off. Namaste and woof woof.